How to talk about it. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, a chance to help stack the odds in women's favor by encouraging testing and raising money for research. But it's about more. Up to one in eight women on this planet will develop some form of breast cancer in their lifetime. And we all know a survivor or someone who's battling it will ask about the best mindset to take on this struggle. Most at risk are women over 50, but not only. And even if it's defected, uh, detected early and treated well in time, it hits women often at a time in their lives when their bodies are changing. In a world that's uh, more than ever image conscious, how to make women feel supported, not stigmatized. Today in the France 24 debate, we're putting the spotlight on Pink October and joining us from the French city of Rouen, tech entrepreneur Emilie Dodin, or should I say, uh, Emilie Brunette, that is your handle uh, on social media. Uh, you're a cancer survivor. We'll hear your story in a moment. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Dr. Ines Vaz-Louise, whose work focuses on breast cancer patients and how they fare after treatment. You work at That's Gustave crazy. Roussy Hospital in the suburbs of Paris. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, from Nairobi, Nancy Gitoito, CEO of the Limau Cancer Connection. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. We'll be asking you about uh, the work that uh, your organization uh, does. Th thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. And from Joshua Tree, California, that's east of Los Angeles, designer and artist, uh, uh, Shaney Joe Darden, you founded the global nonprofit organization Keep Abreast. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag uh, F24 debate. Uh, Emilie Dodin, yeah, you don't fit the, 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 the you, you don't fall into the averages. You were 33 years old. It was last year in October where you were diagnosed. You're a, a, a busy woman, full on, a mother, a full time job, and you get this uh, diagnosis. Yes, it was very um, difficult for me because um, I don't have a background of cancer in my family. Um, and uh, I had my daughter, my second child, two years ago. And uh, three months later, I found a lump in my breast. And I immediately thought of cancer. But uh, I was very, uh, um, I was feeling uh, uh, re re reassured by my um, midwife who told me that breast cancer doesn't hurt, it doesn't get painful. So I was, okay, it's okay. <laughs> and uh, a few months later, uh, the lump co uh, continued to get bigger. And then uh, I finally get an echography, a mama, mama, echography mammaire. I don't know the word in English, I'm sorry. And I got a, a mammography just after, and a biopsy, and I found out uh, that I have breast cancer. Uh, the day following, my daughter just turned one, so it was very difficult for me. <laughs> very, it's not, it, was, it, was, it was like a, a tsunami. <laughs> Yeah, and it happened on top of it during uh, during COVID when uh, many people didn't have uh, uh, had doctor's appointments delayed, especially at the outset. And we know what, what the consequences of that ha have been. Emilie, an aggressive form of cancer. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a triple negative breast cancer. Uh, so it's not the best one who gets um, the best... Uh, um, uh, prognosis, prog prognosis, but um, I'm okay. I'm just following. I'm just finishing in in one month uh, my uh, oral chemotherapy, and then I'm okay. So, uh, uh, Ines Vaz um, uh, it's the it's set, there are several stages in the process. Talk us through it a little bit. Well, I think. Um the diagnosis of breast cancer is a turning point in the life of any patient. Suddenly you are well and suddenly we have something that puts in risk your life. And of course that the experience is different depending on your age, depending on your support, but that it's such a long track from the diagnosis into the treatment, into the after treatment, that I think we 
all as a medical community have to really embrace our patients and do our best to personalize and to take care of the all patient, not the tumor, but the patient, and the patient that is young as a little kid, wants to keep the, the, the job and wants to grow in the job, and we have to support the, 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 the old patient in that track, and while maximizing their chance and you heard of getting Emily, rid of the pet You heard Emily tumor. describe it as a tsunami, of course, the news. How do you then help, are, are we getting better at helping people along as they prepare themselves for the fight to come? I hope so. <laughs> I think that's part of my, of my job and that's part of my ambition to, well, a lot of my work is focused really on embracing quality of life and helping patients to, to embrace the full experience. But I think we have a long way to go and I think we have a long way to go also to personalize that experience and to, to really understand to each of the patient that is in front of us what matters. How do we do choices that are patient uh, sensitive and that go uh, with the, the, the track that the patient wants to choose for them while maximizing their chance and while maximizing their quality of life? Well, maximizing uh, their quality of life, uh, Nancy Gitoito, uh, how does this, how does it, uh, how do you do that when when you have uh, a, d a disease that well people are scared of and they don't want to talk about? Right. Uh, so we have a platform called the Mouth Cancer Connection, where we support breast cancer patients. And the first thing that we do that really, really help breast cancer patients is connecting them, especially with uh, breast cancer survivors who are, have survived this thing, so that we can show them it's not a death sentence. Number two, most of the breast cancer patients, when they're told by their oncologists that they have to come in from mastectomy, most of them are very, very scared. And they're like, what am I gonna wear after that? And that is why we make the knitted boobies and we donate to them. We're like, well, at least they, you have something to wear after that and nobody's gonna know what you're having. You know, whether you don't have a breast or not, you can always wear, wear that and go to a wedding, go to church, go to work. Uh, number three, we also connect them with nutritionists. We connect them with uh, people in the community who are advocates. And this actually shows them that there's life after cancer. There's a lot of encourage, um, encouragement when they get to learn and hear other stories from uh, cancer patients, uh, their journey, what they have been through. And sometimes um, there are breast cancer events where we have participated in shaving our hair. And if there are family members who want to participate in holding the patient's hand to show them that, you know, it's not about your hair, it's about keeping you alive. And that's all we are all about. It's just helping you with all the resources that we can to help you make a lemonade out of your cancer journey. <laughs> to make, help make a lemonade. Uh, Nancy, let me ask you, initiatives like Pink October, are they having an impact in Kenya? Are, are more people from the broader public, you know, uh, more aware and more understanding? Uh, yes, I have been doing this for the last four years. I run the biggest breast cancer here in Kenya. And uh, I, I started this after losing my mother to breast cancer, and I realized there was no awareness going on in the country. Uh, and then there was the wrong information where people had all these myths, oh, if I'm next to a cancer patient, I'm going to get it, you know? So we had to fight the stigma and make these women, you know, have a, their own family where they can understand about breast cancer. So even as we donated the needed prosthetics to make them, you know, have that self-esteem, we realize the community has lack of awareness on the symptoms, where that, uh, what is breast cancer and where does it come from? So this year, we have the Breast Cancer Chat for Limau, and we are teaching the community the 15 symptoms of breast cancer. And they're very, very um, elaborate, uh, the, the, the diagrams and the photos uh, for that illiterate person who cannot read, but when they see the diagram, 
they can be able to see, oh, if I have blood that's coming out of my breast, I need to go see a doctor. If I have a nipple that's invited, I need to go see a doctor. So we should be launching the program next week on YouTube, on Facebook. And we really want a lot of people to get this information out. And um, we realize also the women who are donating this knitted prosthetics, they most of them were coming in with stage four breast cancer, which has spread to other organs. And so our goal is to make sure we are getting a lot of people who are stage zero, stage one, which increases their chances of living and survival, as opposed to the ones with metastasized breast cancer that, you know, it has gone to the lungs and the brain because they, they do not know the early symptoms. So we are dealing with a very, very sensitive community. And I hope uh, we can be able to reach like 10 million, you know, with enough resources that, you know, the, the ones in the rural areas, uh, we've been having issues because of COVID. We cannot do physical awareness. So most of our awareness is online, but we can only target the ones who have smartphones. So it's it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge uh, getting there. When you listen, Shaney Joe Darden, to, uh, to Nancy talking about... Uh, 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 raising awareness uh, in Kenya. Uh, what's it like where you are in California? Um, thank you. And thank you for having in me. California. And we are working um, all over the world with Keep Abreast. So even we have a program in Africa, in um, the Congo. And as Nancy was talking about being able to reach people through their smartphones, Keep Abreast has an app. So it's a beautiful app. It's called the Keep Abreast app, and we're able to reach people all over the world about education, about breast cancer prevention. And so in California, you know, we have a lot of awareness. We have many, many campaigns, many walks, many pink events and things like that. And as Keep Abreast, our focus is on women under 40. So we really focus to educate women about early detection and about prevention. And one of the best ways of doing that is doing your self-check through the Keep Abreast app. And, and uh, you know, like we said at the outset, people like Emily Dodin, who are in their 30s getting breast cancer, it's a minority, but is it a growing minority? Um, it's definitely a growing minority globally. You know, over 12,000 women every year under 40 are diagnosed with breast cancer just in the United States. So it is growing and it is important, you know, especially for women like Emily and like many women that most of us know who have been diagnosed under 30. It's important to have these conversations with young women in their 20s, you know, as you're beginning college. You know, it's really important to think about your breast health and knowing your breasts and knowing what's normal for you before you turn 40. Before you turn 40, about raising awareness, about staying positive. Uh, near where you are, Angela Trimber, a Los Angeles-based dancer and actress, uh, has become something of an Instagram star chronicling her fight against breast cancer ever since 2018. Uh, dancing means exercise, according to the World Health Organization, Exercise is great, both for prevention and for prevention of a recurrence uh, uh, of breast cancer. France 24's Claire Pacalin went to France's second city, Lyon, for uh, uh, an innovative I initiative when it comes to exercise. Stop. With their swords drawn, these women are all battling a common enemy. They're all suffering from breast cancer. While some are in remission, others are still going through chemotherapy, like Natalie, who was diagnosed last March. Les scrims, c'est une bonne activité de défouloir pour décharger. Et puis souvent, on, on associe en fait le l'ennemi invisible qu'on a en face de son sabre. En fait, on associe euh, le crabe, le cancer, et donc euh, avec notre sabre, on va le pourchasser, on va le pourfendre, on va le pulvériser, on va l'exploser en mille morceaux. Most of the fencers are recovering from the after effects of the illness. Fencing can help them to build up strength in their arms, especially where their scars are. Pas se crisper au niveau de l'épaule, mais essayer vraiment d'avoir un geste fluide. 
Their teacher has been specially trained in this post-cancer therapy. On va travailler du côté qui a été opéré, ce qui veut dire que une femme qui est droitière et qui a été opérée à gauche, elle va travailler du côté gauche. Si elle a été opérée des deux côtés, on va travailler des deux côtés. On va vraiment travailler sur des gestes hautes qui vont leur permettre justement de lever un peu plus le bras, de retrouver une, une mobilité qu'elles ont perdue suite à l'opération. Several studies have shown that physical exercise can reduce the risk of cancer recurring by 25% and improve survival rates by 30%. Martine's cancer reoccurred twice. Since she started fencing training, she's noticed her health has improved. Je me rends compte que je récupère de l'amplitude de mon bras droit grâce au fait aux exercices que l'on nous fait faire. On vient fatigué et on repart plein de pleine force en fait. For these women, fencing helps them find the force to fight back against breast cancer. So, uh, Emilie Dodin, a mother of two, is already exercise a plenty. But uh, let me ask you, uh, have you, uh, what, what's your uh, regimen like now? Have you changed your habits when it comes to exercise? I used to exercise a lot. Uh, I used to, to, to run, but I, I stopped it because it was very so painful in my breasts. Um, but now I start... Um, uh, to swim once a week, uh, one kilometer or more, and I'm going to start Pilates as well. Uh, so I know that uh, I can um, work on my entire body, but I'm very um, thankful because and grateful because my right arm is okay. I can I can do everything because um, I just have two uh, two uh, nodes uh, to 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 be. Uh, I just get rid of two notes, so it's okay for me now. But um, yeah, it's, the sport is very great to, to recover and to feel better and to feel yourself again. To feel yourself again. It's, it's, uh, uh, after the tsunami, as you described it, uh, of getting the prognosis, after the treatment, uh, which is very heavy, especially if you have chemotherapy, uh, how do you become yourself again? What do you do? I, for for me, I just, I um I keep working because I'm an an, an entrepreneur, so I didn't have the choice, uh, and it helped me a lot to not lose everything, to not lose my hair, to not lose uh, my my breasts, and my work was my my everything. So when when your hair keeps keeps um, it keeps falling it was very awful because you're you're like oh my god i i don't uh, recognize myself in the mirror but uh, but uh, yeah i start to, i continue to 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 get uh, dressed every day and to do my job every day and it helped me a lot and uh, it helped me a lot also to not um, have a bad opinion on myself in the mirror because I was just hoping uh, for the day my hair will come back again because I was bald for many months. It was very difficult uh, because I kept uh, I kept looking uh, at my memories of my old hair and my old life. But um, you have to to have a purpose, and for me it was uh, the end of the treatment. So it's my it's my goal, <laughs> and uh, and to keep. To keep being busy helps a lot. Yeah, Ines Vaz Luis, if keeping a goal, what do you what do you tell patients to help them get through this rough period? So I think it's a little bit what we spoke uh, before. I think it's important this personalization for each patient. The goals are different, so it's about to try to find with which patient what is important to them, and how can we achieve that goal together. So to give you a sense, what we are trying to do is to seize the diagnosis, like trying to predict what is going to be the struggles of the patients. And then a little bit um, in the same sense of uh, what we hear here today in this emission, we are trying to empower patients to give them more education and to try to making the cancer a learning experience and learning experience to engage more in healthy behaviors and like this 
um, protect you from cancer recurrence, but also to uh, empower you and to protect you for other types of diseases. So really transform this experience. Because you yeah. found uh, in your work that oftentimes in the past, cancer patients and breast cancer patients in particular, they, they are subject to get to weight gain, to uh, fatigue. I'm talking about afterwards when they finish the treatment. Uh, in our treatment, so we know that a substantial proportion of our patients will have deterioration of their quality of life and some of the domains of quality of life. So we know that things like severe fatigue, weight gain, it, it can be a reality for a lot of our patients. So that's the the bad news, I have, I work with a patient that usually tells me this. Well, it's important to know that that may be the bad news. The good news is that we can do things from, for the patients. We can help them in that journey. Like for example, if someone has severe fatigue, we know that physical exercise helps. Um, there are solutions, pharmacological and non-pharmacological, that can help patients uh, uh, facing these struggles. The, the French but, healthcare system can seem a little impersonal at times. Are they? Do you feel as though those who set policy uh, in Paris are aware of all of this? I think it's our job to push them uh, in that direction. One thing, so 10 years ago, we created a big cohort of cancer survivors that is it's called the Canto Court. It is the biggest cohort of cancer, the biggest, deepest cohort of cancer survivors in the world. And Cantu is teaching us a lot of the struggles of the patients. And this is creating a tsunami in French research and in world research about trying to make at that point to the health authorities that this is a problem that we have to tackle and we have to help patients more and more in this way. And I think, for example, if I look at my institution, we just launched a program that will support patients in that after cancer experience, mm. like really trying to focus on the issues on quality of life, giving them support um, strategies. So I think we are doing, I hope we are doing our way on that direction. Okay. Uh, the uh, incidence of breast cancer worldwide uh, keeps growing and keeps growing on every continent. There's a steady rise in cases as we've been discussing, uh, for women under uh, the age of uh, 50. And there you see uh, the graphs uh, uh, that are, uh, where you see the, the incidents that, are, that have gone up. These are according to the World Health Organization and The Lancet, the medical journal. The good news, the mortality rate has uh, either flatlined over the past two decades or uh, in the case of Europe and North America, you can see uh, the, the parts that are in green and red there. Uh, they've dropped dramatically, uh, both uh, for over for the for all women and for those uh, who are under the uh, uh, the age of fifty. Uh, Nancy Gitoito, I'm haunted by something you said to me uh, uh, a short while ago. You said to us that uh, many of those who come to you are in stage four of cancer and come late to uh, for for treatment. Do you get the sense that there's a dramatic increase in breast cancer cases or is there a better diagnosis right now well we have a problem with diagnosis in kenya uh, there's a lot a lot of misdiagnosis cases but we do have amazing amazing oncologists who are doing amazing jobs here and also educating and trying to um train more oncologists and um doctors on proper diagnosis so we have seen some improvement on the diagnosis, but also uh, the reason why we've been having high death mortality rates for breast cancer is because of lack of awareness. So as doing the awareness in the grassroots, we are actually helping the oncologist and uh, giving the patient the right information uh, and giving them the education they need so that when they start going for their early screening, when they are stage zeros and stage one and stage twos uh, to increase their survival rate. So, um, and I also know that Kenya is working on the research. Uh, I know in America, one of the things that we've been having is, um, and even here, 
the research has been more on um, white people and not the African Americans and the Africans. So that is where the focus is right now. So you'll find the medicine is working on um, people of uh, the white color and uh, not really working on the African Americans or the Africans. So that is part of the research that really the doctors in Kenya are working to get uh, better research so we can get better treatment and a cure to breast cancer. Yeah, and uh, they, they've we've discussed on this show in the past how there's been talk of a, a cancer epidemic in Africa. Is that because uh, of, again, is it a question of diagnosis? Is it a question of the fact that people's life expectancy has grown, so they've developed more of a chance of getting cancer? Or is it also because of lifestyles? What with people moving from the countryside to the city where perhaps they don't eat as well as they used to and subject to pollution and the such? I think it's a, it's a mix of all lifestyle. There's also hereditary, uh, which if you have a member of your family who has breast cancer, of course your chances and your risk are higher. Uh, lifestyle, yes, Kenyans love alcohol and red meat. We call it nyamachoma. So we have been working with nutritionists and uh, dietitians to help Kenyans change their lifestyle to plant-based diet and, you know, get into the exercise routine, which are, we, I think we are working very well towards that. Uh, there are a number of risk factors as well, you know, your stress levels, living in the city with all this pollution going on is not uh, very good. And, it, you know, it creates a good environment for cancer, you know, to grow. But uh, we've been doing a lot of awareness. And I think in another 10, 15 years, we should start seeing uh, the breast cancer mortality rate literally going down. And people are becoming more health conscious now, especially with COVID coming in. Uh, people are really watching what they're eating, what they're doing and educating themselves a lot or through the internet. So that's that's some good news on our part. All right, good news there. Uh, you talk about awareness, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Well, it means, you know, a pink Eiffel Tower. Uh, the White House was in pink at the start of the month. Uh, there have been uh, great fundraising drives like the one last Saturday in uh, Caracas, where Venezuelan uh, breast cancer charity Seno Salud uh, organized a haircut drive to provide uh, wigs uh, for cancer patients. It's heartwarming, but it can also be a little nerve-wracking um, for some. Holly Burns is a San Francisco area writer. In the New York Times, uh, she penned a piece where she said the following, October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I'm a person who's had breast cancer, which means that for me, October is basically 31 days of low-key PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. My inbox is crammed with marketing emails featuring other survivors' story. My hummus suddenly has a pink lid. I appreciate the focus on fundraising, but the spotlight is a double-edged uh, sword. Shaney Jo Darden, your, your thoughts on that. Uh, uh, how do you broach the subject of raising awareness without it being too in your face uh, for those who perhaps want to tune out and not have 31 days of full-on talk about breast cancer. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely the responsibility of organizations to really vet um, the partnerships that they have. And pinkwashing is happening all over the world, and it's something that we talk about. And as Keep a Breast Foundation, we need these partnerships. We need these different fundraising things to raise money for our programs. But at the same time, we work very diligently to make sure that we are not working with brands that use toxins and chemicals that are in their products that are linked to causing cancer. You know, we work very hard on transparency. We stay away from phrases like a percentage of proceeds. All the brands that we work with, you know, they're responsible for their donations and for their actions and really working hard to make sure that it says on each product what the donation is and also, 
imploring all of those partners to use their voice to educate, not just sell something, but to take the time to educate their audience about prevention, about early detection, and about the resources that are available out there for women who are diagnosed. And yes, it can be a very triggering time for many, many, many survivors out there. And the world has a long way to go. The pink ribbon has been um, just definitely overused. So we ask people to look at what they're buying, ask questions, and if you want to make a donation, you can just donate directly to the organizations that you care about and that you feel passionate about. Yeah, so that's what you mean by pink washing. Yes. I mean, pink washing is something where you see many brands out there, like you were pointing out in the article, they just put a pink lid on their hummus. And you don't know if they're giving three cents, two cents, one dollar to what organization and how it's helping. So pink washing is the same as green washing. You see rainbow washing. Um, it's a marketing tactic that um, needs definitely to have a little bit more control of. So, uh, Emily Dodin, you're, you're uh, a year out from treatment. Um, you're still in that remission period for several years. Uh, your thoughts on this, is, it, is October too much? Or you say, bring it on, this is great. The more the, the message gets out there, the better. We need prevention. We need to, to raise funds as well to, to, to pay for all the programs for the research because it's very important. Uh, but yeah, I can, I can see that so, there is a lot of pinkwashing, I agree. Um, and, uh, but some brands are very committed to fund rents, to fund a raise, uh, to, to get money. And um, so I think it's too much. And also, uh, I think for me, uh, we should talk about breast cancer all year long. It's not about October. It's it doesn't stop in October. That's why uh, when I post about uh, my cancer last year, I did it on the uh, November first because I wanted to to talk about cancer, but not during all this pink October and to to raise awareness all year long. And uh, that's what I'm doing <laughs> on my account. And we we are with like that, the French brand. We're just working on um, promoting uh, self-check and to raise money uh, for Gustave Roussy uh, for a special program for triple negative uh, breast cancer uh, people. And um, I think we, we should talk about breast cancer all year long, but not also not only breast cancer because you have very different kind of uh, cancer for women, like ovary cancer and different kind of cancer. Yeah, but so. Let me ask you then. Uh, this is great because your your uh, again your name on Instagram is uh, Emily Brunette, and so yeah. when do you allow yourself? Can, do you, are you able to be Emily Todin, or do you find yourself being Emily Brunette twenty four seven? Um. Ah, uh, uh, I'm myself all day long. <laughs> I don't know. Uh. <laughs> It's, it's, yeah, I don't want to talk about cancer every day. Is it is it if it's your question? Yes, it is. It's 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 that is it is it? I guess the question, the follow up question to, and I'll I'll cut to the chase here is what's the best way for people to to be supportive? And we talked about pink washing, but also uh, people to 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 really uh, support you and not just remind you of harrowing experiences all the time. Just to be there first, I think it's important when you don't know what to say to someone, just say, I'm thinking of you, I hope you're okay. And then, uh, if, uh, are you talking about like, it's for a friend or for... A <laughs> yeah, yeah, for friends, for, yeah. for people you meet. You can, you can, I was thinking about it and um, if you, don't, don't buy flowers, just buy something very important and very great, it's like products. Uh, because uh, for some people, it's very expensive to buy a special cream, a special uh, shampoo, because yes, you lose hair, but then when you grow again, you have to, to adapt your, your, your skincare. Um, just buy something very great, like a, a beanie, you know, for winter when you lose your hair, because it's very 
uh, chilly. <laughs> you need to have uh, to have some warm uh, some warm clothes as well. But uh, you have d different things to do. But if you can also support cancer um, initiative like uh, some fundraiser. For my birthday, I asked my friend to to get some money to the research because we need money uh, to get new treatments and uh, to to get rid of cancer. I think, I hope one day we will get rid of cancer, but uh, we need money for this. You need money for that. And uh, Dr. Yeah. Ines uh, Vaz-Louise is nodding vigorously when you say that. Uh, uh, of course, you can't expect every ca breast cancer patient to open an Instagram account and to and to be as outgoing as uh, as Emily is. So, w what's the advice you give them on how to cope with the fact that we talk about it perhaps too much for some in one short burst and then not enough for the rest of the year? Well, I think we as a medical team have. To, have to uh, we have to make sure that we do exactly what Emily said, is we are there for you. And they have to know that we are there for, uh, for them. And uh, often my patients say, I want to live after cancer. I don't want just to survive after cancer. They often uh, get, um, and I, I think we have to, to help them in that, you know, that that new goals and yet that new life. And I nodded because I truly believe that we are advancing so much in terms of uh, cancer research that I hope that one day in my lifetime, we get to a world with where we have less and less cancer that will, um, that, uh, that will take uh, our loved ones away from us and that we are able to tackle also all the side effects of the treatments that we give to patients. Um, you're an oncologist, you do medical research. Uh, do you find yourself being a psychologist? Uh, well, I think as an oncologist, I'm not a psychologist at all. No, but do you find I have yourself having to deal with these, team, with, with, the, with, with these issues? I, you know, we're talking about how to support people yeah, here. I, well, I think it's part of my education as an oncologist to be able to learn and to be able to be there to my patients. And I hope I'm there for them and they know that. For some, I probably, some probably will connect better than others. And so for that, those others, I have to make a better, uh, a bigger effort. But as an oncology is a big part of my job to make sure that they know that I'm there and to support them and to ask help to healthcare, to mental health care professionals when I see that my patient needs that help at that point. Nancy uh, Getoito, uh, what's your experience when it comes to the bedside manner, not just of uh, doctors, but uh, also of loved ones uh, who are uh, with a breast cancer patient? So over here in Kenya, we really went hard on the doctors and uh, it was not a very easy experience because uh, I work hand in hand with patients and being in a platform like Limau, they're able to express their emotions. They're able to tell us what exactly is going on in their hospital. So coming with, from my experience, my mom was told she had breast cancer and uh, the doctor who told her she had breast cancer really did not have empathy and so it came as a death sentence to her she cried a river all night you know thinking she's gonna die and that really made me question myself you know we need uh doctors to be more empathetic you know just sympathetic and and i know as much as this is the diagnosis maybe they can work with counselors who can be able to relay that information in a more gentle way. Because some of these patients, sometimes they, they, they fall into depression. And with my patients who have been in the groups, I have seen even some refusing to go through mastectomy uh, because they're like, oh, if I lose my breast, my husband is going to leave me. Uh, how is the society going to take me? So <clears throat> when we raise these issues, with the, with the oncologists that we have been working with, they have really, really, really improved and uh, have been working with 
uh, counselors and uh, psychologists. So we have seen a great, great improvement in our medical industry here in Kenya. Before that, it was a disaster. We were having patients who just like, you know, were not even staying six months. They were dying just because of their news, you know, the way they were told they had breast cancer, not even just breast cancer, any other type of cancer. And then also the, the loved ones, the caregivers who are the family members, we allow them to be in the group so that way they can learn how to talk to the patients. They can learn the right words that these patients want to hear. Sometimes when you have a patient who is really, really terminally ill, you know, and needs palliative care, sometimes they just want you to sit there with them. Don't even say nothing. Just be there, hold their hand in their last days. And that's even very, very comforting. We'll give them tips, you know, make play for them a song that they love, you know, read them a story, remind them of hilarious times that will crack them up. And this is really what the, the, the groups and the patients have really been appreciative because it is not common to find it out there. So we have been able to implement and uh, I must say that all these policies I have learned and uh, from the Susan G. Komen uh, in the U.S. because I live in San Francisco. I'm a big advocate there. And uh, I, I had to learn the strategies of what can I do to save my people in Kenya? Because when I'm out here, I see cancer patients in the U.S. surviving. You know, stage four, they, they live very long. What can we do? Are there little things that we can be able to mitigate and save our own people? So being able to involve... Um, being able to involve cancer patients and their caregivers and their friends has really been helping a lot and not just for the, the cancer patient because when cancer comes into your home, it is not just one person. It affects the whole family, the whole, the family. whole community. Yeah. So it... Let, yes. let, let, me, let me just pick up just before we leave because we're out of time. Um, Earlier, uh, Inez Vaz-Louise talked uh, about uh, patients don't want to survive, they want to live, and talked about how you can discover new things about yourself. So, Emily Dodin, what's the superpower that you've acquired through the, uh, this, uh, this ordeal? I think I'm like um, the cancer advocate. I mean, I'm just uh, doing uh, my own job to to help people to get self-check, to go to their appointments, to to get their uh, health back again, and um, to not uh, cancel a meeting with your uh, with your doctor or gynecologist because you don't have time. Go, just go for it. And so if this is my superpower. I'm very, it's like my new work is to help awareness about this disease. And uh, no, I don't care about anything. I just, run and go for it all right well we sweat you bon courage and uh, uh we'll hope we'll f f check in with you soon i hope uh, to talk about it some more emily dodin thank you so much for joining us from uh, the french city of rouen uh, i want to thank <clears throat> as well uh, dr ines uh, vaz louise uh, nancy getoito in uh, nairobi and uh, shaney dodarden in joshua tree california thank you for being with us here in the france 24 debate thank you.